Anytime I'm doing a presentation, I like to start with good news. So when you look at this, it is good news. So what I'm, the statement I'm going to make is there's arguably never been a better time to be a startup than now. So when Brian and Darmesh, our two co-founders, got together from MIT and started HubSpot back in 2006, it cost them about $200,000 to start HubSpot. Fast forward to 2017, arguably the same amount of costs are today in 2018, 2019, what cost them $200,000 now costs them about $1,200 today. So it's good news, right? It's never been a better time to be a startup. On the contrary, it's never been a harder time, I guess, to go from a startup to a scale up. What I'm showing you here, this is basically the marketing landscape that has almost 7,000 companies in it. But back in 2006, there was about 50, right? So when you think about it, it's arguably never been a better time to be a startup, and it's harder than ever to be a scale up because there's so much competition out there. So why is that happening? Well, today, buyers are really in control, right? So when you think about the go-to-market strategy, it's never been a better time to be a startup. It's harder to be a scale-up. There's a ton of competition out there. Buyers have a ton of control. We have to change the way we go to market. We can't just hire salespeople, have them cold call, and annoy a buyer today. So the way we go to market has changed, and we have to adapt. What's interesting, this is a statistic that says 77% of a prospect or a potential customer has done research on your product or service and your brand before they've even reached out to you, before they've chatted with you online, before they've given you an email. They have read your uh, About Us page. They have looked at your team. They have, they have done the background information and research on your company. So when you think about that, right, you have to be really smart about how you're going to go to market and how you're going to interact with people because they know a lot about you already. 77% of people know about you already. And what's interesting, when we think about a go-to-market strategy, often when I say go-to-market, I mean marketing and sales, but we'll talk today about product and customer service and how that ties into it as well. If you take a look at this, you've got doctors, nurses, scientists, teachers, you've got, you know, Salespeople, marketers, stockbrokers, car salespeople, politicians, and lobbyists, right? So it's not very good news if you are out there being a, a salesperson or a marketer today. You're not very trusted. So what do we have to do to you know, allow our buyers to trust us, to build trust during that process is a really important thing. So we're going to talk about how this all fits in today, but I wanted to frame it. And when you think about being a salesperson or a marketing person, it's really about how you can help, right? What problem is your customer trying to solve? What are they doing research on? And then how you can help them is a question that at HubSpot over the years, I've been at HubSpot for eight and a half years um, in the sales org the whole time, and we start every conversation with how can I help? You came to HubSpot, you told us, you, you chatted with us, you filled out a form, you told us your big, biggest marketing challenge was lead generation. How can I help you? Right? That's how the sales conversation has to go because I can't just interrupt that person's day to day. I have to help them as a trusted advisor. So when you think about that, just think about the landscape and how things have changed and think about how you're going to adapt your own go-to-market strategies for your business. As we think about setting this all up right, and we think about the go-to-market, I like to say there's really three phases. Phase one is the MVP phase. You're really just trying to get initial traction. You're going out there talking to your friends and family. And you're just trying to get anyone who will be a customer. Because you're really trying to get and collect as much feedback as you possibly can. Then there's product market fit, which two years ago I would have told you led with customer acquisition, unit economics, you know, are you acquiring your customers at a good pace? And how, how, is that, uh, does it look healthy on how you're actually acquiring them? What's interesting is now when I do a lot of mentoring and talk to startups, the number one thing we're talking about is customer success. So when you think about do you have product market fit, so many people think that's like, are you acquiring customers and are those customers growing with you? I would argue we're going to talk about today why customer success is a really important metric for how you're starting to identify if you have product market fit. What's also really cool about this, and I'm starting to see it internally inside of HubSpot, is over time, our customer success org has felt like a second-class citizen. 
What's happening now is we're shifting. It's all about customer first. It's all about the customer. You know, HubSpot has product market fit. What I'm telling you today is we started to shift and think about customer first a little too late. So what we always try and do inside of HubSpot is take all the mistakes that we made as a startup and a scale up and tell all of you so that you can grow faster, you can be uh, more successful than HubSpot, and you don't have to make the same mistake that we made. So that's where a lot of this is coming from today is that we don't want you to make the mistakes that we made. And the mistake that we made back in 2010, so HubSpot started in 2006, 2010 happened, we had a churn issue. We were acquiring a really great customers and they were leaving us. And we had to stop everything and figure out how to actually solve that churn problem. And what we're gonna talk about today is if you actually think about product market fit as you're acquiring really good customers and they're growing with you, I think you can avoid that problem. And then the third stage is growth and scale. So we'll talk today about um, how you're gonna hire the right people, create a repeatable uh, hiring process, and then grow and scale that over time. I've got like some scorecards and we can talk about some data around who the right people are to hire early uh, in your business so that you can grow and scale. And then we'll talk about alignment and operating systems and some pricing and packaging as well. This is an interesting chart. I actually really like to talk about it because when I speak to startups, what's interesting is they'll come to me and they'll be like, we're growing 200% year over year. And I was like, okay, great. So your customer acquisition is great. How many customers are you keeping six months from now? They don't really focus on that, right? I'm a startup CEO. I'm just focusing on getting customers today, Kim. Okay, well, how many customers are sticking with you six months from now? So when you think about this chart, you've really got two options. Option B, I'll say that one first, because it is, in my opinion, not the best option, is you can grow 100% year over year, and you can have 50% revenue retention. So you acquire 100 customers, 12, 13 months from now, only 50 are left. Option A is if you could focus on product market fit with customer retention and customer happiness is you're gonna grow at 100% year over year and your revenue retention is gonna be 100%. So you're gonna acquire 100 customers this year and 100 customers are gonna stay with you next year. And then as you think about new products and services that you can release, you can actually start to sell more to your customer base. And you could arguably say, Kim, we're not looking to sell more, we're looking to add more value. We're looking to solve more of our customers' problems over time. That's, what you, that's the scenario you get into as a growth and a scale-up mode if you can take option A to a path of healthy growth. This is something back at HubSpot, it, we have been maniacally focused on this. Like I said, we had a churn problem in 2010. You've probably heard other people from HubSpot talk about that. But one of the reasons, what, this is just, uh, I would say like irrelevant data. Don't look at this and say, wow, like this is not real HubSpot data, just so you guys know. But what happened is if, uh, you know, back in 2010, if you look at this in month, month 13, it would be all red. Month 12 would start to be like yellow and orange. Month 10, yellow and orange. So what happened is we acquired customer until like month eight, they were happy and then something was happening. This is a chart that shows really good healthy growth that says, okay, we're acquiring customers month 12 and month 13, you know, we're losing some when they're going for their annual renewal, but what's happening in month 13 is based on a pricing and packaging model about addition upgrades and more seats, they're paying us more. So they're paying it, so we're acquiring a customer, they're growing with us, they're paying us more on their renewal, which is great, so that means it's healthy growth, and then in month 25, they're still sticking around. Because what you can start to look at if you do these um, cohort and heat map analysis is, you know, is it green? And then does something happen in month 25? And then you want to continue to drag this out. You know, what happens at 36 months? What happens at 37 months? And really start to analyze this. So what I'm really trying to say here is the real product market fit equals are your customers happy? It sounds so simple, but it actually is really hard. And when you think about, like, why is Kim saying that product market fit today equals customer happiness? Is because the subscription economy is here. The buyer's in control. If today, you know, if I don't want Netflix, I, don't, I can cancel by the click of a button. If you don't want to continue with HubSpot, you can cancel, right? It's all about are we adding value to our customers and are they happy because 
things have changed. And if you think about, this is a cool stat that we use all the time about, it's from uh, HBR, is that acquiring a customer can cost anywhere between five and 15 times, or, and 25 times more than retaining one. So when you think about your LTV to CAC and you think about your unit economics, what this is saying is it's, it's better math to acquire a happy customer and have that customer grow with you than continue to go out there and be on this hamster wheel and just acquire as many customers as you possibly can. Again, a lot, of, a lot has changed, right? And what I'm telling you today is a lot of the mistakes that HubSpot has made. And about two years ago, we realized that we were telling everyone it's about a funnel. It's about an inbound funnel. It's about marketing spends time on the top of the funnel, they generate leads, and then sales closes those leads, and then they become a customer. Well, the thing that's wrong with this is a cus the customers are an, uh, an output of the input of marketing and sales. And what we realized, again, with our mistakes, is that that's just wrong. Customers aren't the output. A customer has to sit in the, in the middle. Customers are everything. So our services org, our marketing org, our sales org, all have to be aligned around the customer. And I'll share with you how that, or I'll share with you a little bit more details about how that looks inside of HubSpot, but this was a revelation we had. So I wanted to share that with you because it's no longer about the funnel, now we call this a flywheel and the customer's at the center. I will give Amazon a shout out. They do this, uh, I think, better than anyone. And we probably learned from them on that. Uh, they have growth at the middle of their flywheel, but customers are on the right of it, which actually, I think, like ties into the growth, which uh, if you look up the Amazon flywheel, you can see it. And then when you think about the go-to-market operating model, what I wanted to share with you here is that when you think about on the y-axis the cost to acquire a customer and then customer acquisition and average sale price is what is your go-to-market model? Do you have a channel sales team? Are you doing a partnership model where you want to have a channel sales team that uh, works with partners and then those partners share the message on your behalf? Or do you have an enterprise sales team? If you're forming an enterprise sales team right out of the gate, what I would say to you is you should have the average sales price to support that enterprise sales hire. Do you have an inside sales team? Or do you have a touch us acquisition model like an Atlassian where you actually don't need salespeople, right? Your customers can come to the website and they can purchase without talking to anyone. That, support, that process is pretty cool. We'll talk a little bit about that today. But I'll share with you, if you are going to hire an enterprise sales team, or an enterprise sales hire, you probably want to have an average sales price of at least 25000 for the year, if not more. If you don't have that pricing and packaging strategy, the chances are your unit economics don't make sense, and the cost to acquire a customer and keep it doesn't justify uh, hiring an enterprise sales rep. So with at that ASP, you'd have to go with an inside sales team. And then when you think about the channel sales, enterprise sales, inside sales, and touchless acquisition, how are you acquiring those customers? When you have a channel team, it's when you want to leverage that partner ecosystem to resell your product or service. If you have a touchless model, you should have transparent pricing and self-service so that the customer doesn't have to be sold or talk to a salesperson. If you have an enterprise sales team, you probably should have a pretty complex product that requires a solution architect to support this enterprise sales rep. If you have an inside sales team, you probably have you know, a product that needs to be explained. And what we see a lot when we are doing a lot of mentorship with startups is they think they have a product that doesn't need to be explained, and then they, they want to go to transparent pricing and self-service, but they don't acquire customers and then they're in this really interesting situation where they actually need to hire a salesperson and they don't know who they should hire. So when you think about that, the, the inside sales team, you want to think about those as sort of like inbound consultants, where they can actually understand the buyer's pain point and consult them on the value that your product's going to add. Not an enterprise sales rep where there's a lot of complexity and they need a solution architect. So again, we talked about looking for a success indicator, right? How do you know you have product market fit? And it's about customer happiness. So here's a couple examples. Early on inside of HubSpot, what we said was, is the customer using 
five plus apps. Are they using five plus apps in a period of 30 days? That was an, a leading indicator of success. And if they were using five of our products by 30 days, it meant they were doing a good job on our onboarding and the likelihood and predictability score that we gave them that they would go on to be successful was pretty high. Here's just a couple examples. You can, are they using X features by day seven, by day 30, you know, whatever you decide. Daily active users, weekly active users. Do they have their entire sales team using HubSpot? Do they have their entire marketing team using HubSpot? The other one, which is pretty cool, is do they have a power user? You know, is there someone in there that is the administrator that is logging into the system or your product or service every day? Uh, and are they having success with it? If you can identify a, a power user, what happens is that person typically goes on to become your champion and help you over time and then they become really happy and they, you can start to use them as references and things like that. So again, it's the importance to align around the customer success. You know, all this sounds so easy when I'm like talking about it. It is really, really freaking hard. And when you think about customers today, you know, you can buy a Tesla online by clicking a button and then it will arrive, you know, 14 days after, and you don't have to talk to anyone. What's cool about today's world is customers love simplicity. The number one thing that I think frustrates customers, and I know it frustrates my, me as a customer, is when I've had a really cool buying experience and I haven't had to talk to anyone, but when I have a really shitty customer experience and I need to talk to someone, there's no one to talk to, right? Like That's just awful, who do I call? You know, I have to go to Twitter and then I have to follow them and then I have to direct message them because that's the only way I figured out that I can talk to people, right? So I think as you think about that as, you know, founders and CEOs of your own business, you want to create this seamless, you know, customer acquisition channel with no friction, but then you don't want to invest and worry about are my customers happy? And that's a little bit of backwards thinking. And this is uh, from HubSpot Research, but we always like to share a little bit of data points for you here. But if you can work on making your customers happy, 55% of them, you know, will talk, will share good news about you, which is awesome. 46% of them will be glad to be a customer reference and let you come and video them and let you put their face on your website and they're telling the world how great they think you are. That's awesome, right? Your customers can sell your products way better than a salesperson at the bottom. So when you think about that product market fit, it all ties back to, is your customer happy? Because if your customer is happy, they'll do a lot of work for you. You can put them on a customer panel. If you go to any HubSpot event and you see our customers on the customer panel, that's by design, we want them to be there. We hold a quarterly company meeting and we invite our customers to, to come to that meeting and give us feedback because we wanna hear if our customer's happy, right? Everything that we're starting to do and have started over the last couple of years is all about are our customers happy? Part two is, okay, all this sounds great, but how do you get the internal alignment piece? So this is where I'm proposing, and uh, I, a bunch of startups that uh, we talk to on a daily basis have really started to do this. And then I will share with you my global team, we started to do this as well. And what we've done specifically within our team is we have a monthly meeting and I used to start it with all of our metrics and we did like a home run, like yay, here's how great we're doing, here's a hockey stick chart up and to the right. That's now at the end. And what's at the beginning is a customer story. And then from the customer story, our customer onboarding. And then we start to dig into the data, how are we doing with our customers? So we've shifted the entire focus of running the business. And when you think about the alignment here, you've got sales hiring, right? So hire someone who wants to help your customers. Don't hire someone who just wants to take their money. The sales compensation. I'll get into an example of how you can compensate your salespeople, but you can put some really interesting customer happiness and revenue retention metrics on your sales compensation. Customer success and onboarding, you know, measure that. Compensate the customer success org on onboarding happy customers. Marketing, define a, we call them QLs and I'll talk to you a little bit about what that means, but that's a qualified lead, you know, compensate marketing on how many qualified leads are they actually driving for the business. 
And then product and engineering. Talk to them and align all around like customer enhancement. When are your customers the happiest? And product should know that, right? Product shouldn't just be sitting in a siloed area building all the coolest product that they think is cool. They should be listening to customers and building that product, right? The other thing that I'll share with you, and I have seen a bunch of startups start to do this, not every startup founder is making the decision to hire a full-time voice of the customer role, but you can get pretty creative around this, and you can hire a voice of the customer role part-time. You know, and look for someone in your organization that likes to help and make sure and you know, gets joy when people are happy. Hire the voice of the customer. We have this role inside of HubSpot now, and it works really cross-functionally, and they arguably have the loudest voice inside of the company. It's important to give them that voice. And then we back this up with data I want to share with you that 74% of voice of the customer programs that companies roll out are successful. So when you think about how you're going to grow your business in a healthy way, again, I'm repeating myself a lot, but it's all about the customer, right? So this is a really cool way uh, from a programmatic perspective to you know, hire someone in there or uh, have someone do it part time. And then just give them a, a meeting cadence, right? Give them 20 minutes at the beginning of every meeting uh, to talk about the happiness score of your customers. We've started to see the SLA with product marketing and sales. And then what they do in a monthly recap meeting within the company, they align product marketing and sales in that meeting and it's not just marketing and sales anymore, it's all three combined. So when you think about this, only 33% of companies have an SLA. And an SLA is really great because, you know, way back when I first started HubSpot, I used to love selling HubSpot to marketing because I knew what it was like when a VP of sales came into the room and said to marketing, you're not generating enough leads for our sales team. And marketing would be like, we're generating a ton of leads to your sales team. Your sales team isn't just following up on those leads. So an SLA is a really good commitment level within each other to say, okay, I'm the head of marketing, I'm the head of sales, and I'm gonna, in marketing, I'm gonna generate 500 leads a month for you, and I need that your sales team to follow up on every single one in a time period that actually matters. If a lead comes in, a qualified lead or a high intent lead, and a sales rep follows up on that, you know, within five minutes, a day, two days, I think it's a 48 hour window, the likelihood of that deal closing is 7x. So it's, it, that SLA and that time commitment matters. Why I'm talking about product, and I think I mentioned it in here, is that now we have an SLA with product marketing and sales because product is starting to generate what we call QLs inside the product. It's not just marketing anymore generating leads. Now product can generate leads for the sales team to close. So this is an example of, uh, I'll share with you here, this is what an SLA looks like, but it's really important to track it. In this case, marketing is signing up for the green bluish bar. And then if marketing can hit that, what's happening with the uh, orange bar is that's the amount of MRR that's projected. That's the amount of revenue that's projected if marketing can hit their SLA, right? So the likelihood, if you're sitting there and you're the CRO or you're you know, trying to understand, are we gonna hit our goals? you have a scientific approach to understanding actually how you're gonna hit your goals. And then on the right, I know this is sort of like a, an eyesore, but on the right, this, sh this shares um, how many deals were created per rep. This is what a manager looks at and a director and a VP of sales. How many deals were created? How many, we call them inbound growth assessments, but basically it's like a consultation call. How many were created? How many demos were delivered? And then how many deals closed? And from here, as a sales manager uh, and the head of a segment working with marketing, once you have that SLA, you can really dig in to say, okay, well, what if you're creating a ton of deals, but you weren't de uh, de uh, delivering a bunch of demos? Something was happening there. Something is breaking down in the uh, customer journey or the prospect journey. This is what I wanted to share with you all as well around like a product-driven QL. And what this means is now product can sign up for a qualified lead, a high intent, someone that they're then in product or within a workflow is now pinging a sales rep that says, this person just took this action in the product, which means now they have a high intent, follow up with them. So what's really cool and sort of from a sales perspective 
is now I have, if I'm a sales rep inside of HubSpot, I'll just use us as an example, now I have leads coming from product, now I have leads coming from marketing, life is good, right? I don't have a BDR, I'm not picking up the phone and cold calling, I'm just taking calls, right? I'm helping people all day long, and that is really what happens. We do not, in our whole small business division, we do not have business development reps. We don't have SDRs. Because we figured this out on how marketing and product and everyone can all work together around that customer and prospect journey. I'm getting kind of scientific here on like QL data, but it's important to understand where those QLs are coming from. So to us, a QL is, did they say they wanted to contact sales in the app, in the product? If yes, we're gonna track that. And we're gonna hand that over to sales really quickly. Did they request a demo? Did they talk to, well, we have something called an inbound sales consultant, which is if you're in a trial, we give you a consultant to talk to. Did they talk to them and did they do an action where that, you know, that can be manual from the inbound sales uh, coach or consultant, and they can say, you know, there's a high intent here, hand that off to sales. There's trial activation, which is kind of cool too. So it all kind of works together, right? So now you have leads just, the point here is that now you have leads coming from product, marketing, and the sales life is pretty cool. Building a data-driven culture, this is a little bit redundant, but the number one thing I'll share with you all as a sales manager, or at, let's say you are a CEO working with the first sales hire, is you have to get data-driven around work rates. Out of everything coming in, are you following up with them? And are they closing, right? So really sort of be scientific and have your close rates and your conversion rates known, publish those to the company and then share them. And then just talk about them. If you've got 50 QLs coming in on a monthly basis and you're closing 25 of them, that's a 50% conversion rate. You can just double down and you can invest in that all day long. That's a great conversion rate, right? The a standard conversion rate on a landing page is about 25%. If, that, if you're converting on a, uh, a product QL at 50% and a marketing landing page at 25%, you know, as a, as a CEO, where are you gonna invest? You wanna invest in those, the product actions all day long. And then this is on, I'll talk to you a little bit about a scorecard about how to hire some salespeople, what has worked for us over time, what works for a bunch of startups we mentor. It's about building a diverse team but the go-to-market hiring. So who do we look for in the hire that we're making? We look for, do you have a growth mindset? Are you curious? Are you coachable? What's your work ethic like? Have you had prior success? And then we used to say something called a cultural fit, but now we say something called, are you additive? Because cultural fit was sort of putting them into this hole of like, are you the same as everyone else? Do you fit what's going on here? And we changed that to culturally additive, which actually starts forcing a completely different behavior, which are you adding something? Is this new person that brings to the team adding something that no one else has? That's additive. So when you think about this go-to-market hiring, these sort of characteristics that we look for, does anyone have a guess about what we started to see was the number one criteria that led to success. It was the two, it was curious and coachable. This is a scorecard. And what you're trying to do is create a repeatable process for who's your first sales hire? What are characteristics are you looking for? How are you weighting that criteria? And if you are right, can you go on to repeat and scale that process of who you're looking for? So this is a really simple, uh, I guess like scorecard to build, you can weight it to whatever you guys decide in terms of what works for your company. And then if this starts to work, you can really scale and hire a lot of sales reps with this equation in mind. And then this is something we do too. I'll sh Some people find this pretty interesting, so I wanted to share it with you. I talk to a lot of organizations and they're like, we just need to hire salespeople, Kim. I'm like, okay. Well, what is your sales enablement strategy or what is your training strategy or do you have a learning and development department? Are you investing in someone to teach your salespeople how to actually do their job? And no one is. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. And that's one thing that I'll share at HubSpot. They did really well early on is they invested when they're hiring their first five salespeople, they invested in a sales trainer to make sure those salespeople knew how to do their job. And then inside of HubSpot specifically, if you are a sales rep and you get hired or wherever you're getting hired into the company, but specifically in sales, I'll tell you guys this, is that you have to learn the product 
for 30 days. So the number one salespeople at HubSpot aren't the best sellers, they have the best product knowledge, right? And then what we do is we have 30, 60, 90, 120 day check-ins. Are you meeting expectations? Are you exceeding expectations? Are you not meeting expectations? If you come out of new hire training and you aren't meeting expectations, that conversation is then shared with the hiring manager and you know, right? You know where you stand every single 30 days, which is really, really helpful. So I would just make sure that if you're gonna uh, adapt something like this, that you do have a 30 day uh, sort of like criteria and feedback loop because again, if you've hired people that care about these things, the number one thing they want is feedback. So it's not always bad, right? Uh, and you can't give uh, what we call like patty cake feedback. You can't give fluffy feedback. We actually have to give radical candor feedback that is also oftentimes hard to give, you know, but you're telling someone what they should stop doing, start doing, continue to do. Um, to just to help them, right? It's coming from a good place. I wanted to share this with you because so many people always ask, okay, you talked about you know, product market fit equals customer success. How do you compensate sales reps? This is an example uh, that you could, if you, if you find it useful, you can sort of take and adapt for your own. But in terms of like, how would you compensate a salesperson? You could do by revenue goal, right? That's easy. How many months up front? You can do a months up front minimum. So oftentimes, you know, I talk to a lot of startup founders about, do you want to do an annual commitment? Do you want to do a semi-annual commitment? You can compensate sales reps to drive that behavior of how long of a term you actually want them to sign up the customers for. So that's a month up front criteria. And then this is really one that's never changed for us is a 13 month retention. So what this means is that you cannot get promoted as a salesperson if you bring on bad fit customers. So it's aligned to the incentives and the compensation which drives the behavior that we want for uh, the salespeople is that we want them to bring on good fit customers. And a lot of people will hit all the other criterias uh, and you have to you know, have 110% attainment, you can't be on a performance plan, but if you miss the 13 month retention, you can't get promoted. And if someone's like, well, that sucks, like I, I, you know, I don't think that's a fair metric. But it is because the expectation's been set that you have to bring on good fit customers because that's what's happening in a SaaS model, right? We need to bring on good customers that grow with us. So build a strong culture based on company-wide values and missions. I would just share that I think this is really important for a couple reasons. So I speak to a bunch of startup founders. Some of them are a little bit apprehensive to share their values and missions, right? They don't want to go out there and tell the world what they care about. And I think that's a little bit silly because everyone that joins your company is wondering what you care about. So I would just encourage you all to really, this is again a little fluffy, but I would encourage you all to think about you know, the why behind it. What are your missions and what is your values? And then you can start to hire people that care about the same things that you all care about that are additive to what you're doing. So at HubSpot, like if you, if you want to be told what to do and you like that style, and some people do, you're not a good fit for HubSpot because what we like to do is hire uh, people who are autonomous and like to figure things out. That's just the culture, right? That's part of the culture code. It's part of our mission and values. We dare to be different and, and challenge the status quo. You know, if you're an employee and you love to challenge the status quo and push people to think differently and raise your hand and write a wiki post and tell our CEO exactly what you would do as a CEO, you're actually gonna get a meeting with him the next day. That's the type of people we want in our company. That doesn't mean you want them in yours, but that's for us and that's who we want, right? So we publish that and we let people read about that and we have a whole em employment brand team that goes out there and shares our culture. We wanna show that to people so that we can attract people who are intrigued by that. And then what we're trying to do is help millions of organizations grow better. And the global segment that I run and Amanda's the director of marketing for it, our mission is we wanna help millions of startups grow better. So we just insert the word startup in there and we're completely aligned to HubSpot as a business. The pricing strategy to reduce friction. What I mean by that is your pricing and packaging strategy shouldn't add friction to your customer acquisition channel. HubSpot research shows when we ask buyers if confusing pricing would keep them from buying, 69% of the people said yes. I actually think 100% of the people 
would say yes, uh, but we'll go with the data. And what's interesting is like how many people have gone to a, a page and looked at someone's product or service and been like, this is confusing. How much do I pay for what and what do I get? So when you think about that, and we go back to what I was sharing with you earlier, like what is your go-to-market strategy? What does your sales team look like? How do you want to share your pricing? If you have a partner channel and you have a sales, uh, a, a channel sales team, is the pricing and packaging only available via your partners? If you have a partner channel, it's a little bit expensive because you're probably going to be paying rev share to those partners who are actually selling your product or service on your behalf. So you have to account for that in your pricing and packaging strategy. If you have an enterprise sales team, typically you have a call us button on your website, which I hate because that means I'm going to get sold to and it means I'm going to have to negotiate and there's going to be a lot of friction there, right? That's by design. I would argue that times are changing, the buyer's in control, they don't want to call us and have a fight with an uh, enterprise sales rep that you know someone got a 10% discount, my friend got a 12% discount, you know, whoever, I'm going to buy something at the end of the month because I know I can get a better deal. You know, you, that's not, is that, is that the world that you as a CEO and a founder or a founding team and a startup, is that the world you want to create, right? I don't know. It's up to you. Transparent and a, at a point to call us, so where your pricing and packaging is a little confusing, they need to talk to someone. It's probably an inside sales model. And then the transparent on the website, a sliding scale, buy now, you know exactly what you get, you can put in your credit card and you're off and running, you know, that's when you can have no sales team. So in terms of the friction, you've got partner friction happening if you have a channel sales team and your pricing and packaging is only available via your partners, you've got some partner friction happening there. If you've got an enterprise sales team and you have a big call us button, you've got a lot of friction happening between you and your buyer. If you've got an inside sales team and your packaging, uh, pricing and packaging on your website is a little confusing, you've got a little bit of friction there. And if you've got a transparent pricing and packaging strategy, you've empowered the buyer, they are clicking, they are putting in their credit card and they're off and running, you've really got no friction. So what that says is you can apply some force and go a little faster there. Partner friction, that's, that's okay, it just happens. And I think when, friction is oftentimes a bad word, but I think what I'm just sharing with all of you is you have to think about and be realists around like how much friction is in this customer acquisition channel and what do we want to do about it? Because you, again, are at the end of the day, are trying to solve for customer happiness. The key takeaways, product market fit is about revenue retention. You know, you want to focus on that. The voice of the customer role is important. I love when startups are investing in that early on, but again, you don't need to go out there and hire someone full time, it's a great intern project, but the key thing is they need to have a cross-functional voice. Strong internal alignment around customer happiness is really important. SLAs, you know, it, it encourages a, a hard conversation at times, but they're pretty good. And then build a framework and a process for your sales team, and then you can repeat and scale. Thank you to AWS Law for having us. HubSpot for startups, what we're doing is we're trying to help startups grow better we give you education, software, all at a startup friendly price. AWS Activate does the same. There's so many companies out there that are creating startup programs for, again, it's no better time to be a startup. I haven't listed them all here, but there's just a lot going on out there for startups. So if you are a startup and you're looking at purchasing a product or service, you know, check and see if they have a startup program because there might be some benefits for you. So thank you.